Um, first things first, um, I want you to warm up. So we're going to do a Mexican wave, like this. Um, don't, be, don't be this guy. Don't, don't be this guy. <laughs> um, but not just like here, but in general. So, so yeah, we're going to go from this side to that and then back. So if you have anything in your lap, put it down, because I'm not joking. We're, go we're really going to do this. So, OK, let's go. Are ready? Are ready? Are ready? Oh, and back. Come on, come on. OK, OK, give yourself a round of applause. OK, cool. So, um, yeah, as Anna said, they invited me to, to come here. Uh, the problem is I don't have anything. Um, so I said, well, I can just talk about stuff that I like. Um, and one of the things that I like is um, talking, to other, talking to other developers. So the stereotype of developer is some guy in the basement hacking away. And I really don't like that because I'm not that guy. And whenever I say to people like, oh, what do you do? I'm a programmer. They're like, oh, you're one of those. Like, no, no, I have a life as well. Um, so because of that, I wanted to start and to showcase that. And I started uh, Parallel Passion. Um, it's, uh, it's a podcast, as Anna said. Um, <laughs> it's just, you know, half my presentation. Anyway, <laughs> so. Um, the thing is, I have like many hobbies. Uh, I like photography. I'm obsessed with coffee. I run. Uh, sometimes I give conference talks. Um, and when I am at conferences, I very rarely talk about development. I almost always talk about other things that people do, because that's what interests me. And that's why I was always thinking about, oh, maybe I should start a podcast. And does, who listens to podcasts? OK, that's like a half. And whoever is not, you should start. Because there's a lot, just not to mine in general, there's a lot of really, really good podcasts. And it's um, podcast is such a nice medium, because you can do something else. Like maybe you're driving, maybe you're washing dishes. Whatever you're doing, there's time for podcasts. It's just instead of radio, and you have quality content and almost no ads. Um, so yeah, I had the idea of doing something about that. And I had the name, which I still love. Like it's sort of uh, technique, it's sort of like passion. It's like PNP, and it's like all parallel and shit. It's like it's really cool. Um, so I said, okay, how hard can it be? And I bought stuff. So for podcasting, you need obviously a microphone, and you need this little unit. It's like a preamp and some headphones. Have coffee, of course. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, um, it's it's definitely there. Oh, there it is. Yeah, you can. <laughs> um, yeah, so and you don't need much, really. It's like 100 euros worth of, of stuff, and you can start. Um, and I will just quickly showcase a couple of people I had. I won't go through everyone. Um, so Yure here, I know him for a very long time. Uh, he's also a Rails developer. Uh, he works, works for ConvertKit. I think they renamed it and then renamed it back. Whatever happened there, I don't know. <laughs> Um, and he's a race car driver, so that's awesome. Um, he's also a car mechanic. Like he likes to, like same as in software, same as hardware. He likes to like repair stuff. Um, and you'd be surprised because like you take some, let's say, open source software, you can change some things and you make it work the way you want it to work. Turns out you can do exactly the same thing to a car. It's, I didn't know that. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so he does that. Um, he has a shit ton of pet projects, and he also loves coffee. So obviously, we had a lot of things to talk about. Um, this is Catherine. Some of you might know her, know her as Kewu. Um, she has done um, many amazing, amazing talks about culture, about ask versus guess. And uh, she has really strong opinions on, on parenting and on how we should have kids be free range, not in this. Um, small environment, protect them from everything, but just allow them to make mistakes. And uh, she also makes jams, <laughs> which is, you know, a, a hobby that you do in, in Portland. So that's fun. Uh, then we had this guy. Um, he uh, makes Codable, which is like TopTel, but only for WordPress. And he's a skydiver. Uh, that's also a sort of unusual hobby. Um, speaking of unusual hobbies, curling. I mean, come on, what is that? And um, 
like I just you know that there's so many things that I don't really understand and I love to talk about. Um, some people here might know Linda. Uh, she founded Rails Girls, which I hope everyone knows what it is. Um, but she writes children's books now, which is amazing. Like, how do you how do you even start writing children's books? That's that's crazy. And just like she's she's amazing. I <laughs> when I when I sent her an email, like, do you want to be on my podcast? And she said yes. I was like, why? Like, <laughs> you know, I, that's crazy. Like, she's uh, I don't know. She was like 30 under 30 in Europe. She's been like top 50 women in tech by Forbes or shit like that. Like, she's really huge. And I'm just you know some guy. And then there's this guy, um, who you know, he's like, um, can can you make a, can you make a talk? It's like, y yeah, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, he's he's like he's a chef, right? He used to be chef. He made web like flash websites. And speaking of chefs, this guy he won the Master Chef. Like he was there on the first BBC Master Chef. He worked with Gordon Ramsay before anyone knew who was Gordon Ramsay. That's incredible. And he also um, runs a coffee subscription business, which is how I get to know him, because I love, no, I love coffee. This thing doesn't work. I love coffee. Yes, I love coffee. Um, that's, that's my espresso machine, by the way. Um, and I, I got to know him because, yeah, I, I subscribed to his um, coffee subscription, and I got really deep into coffee, so now I'm going to speak a bit about coffee. So in 2013, I went to Portland. Uh, if you don't know anything about Portland, Portland is weird. And when people, when I say to people, like, Portland is weird, they, they don't, I don't think they understand how weird Portland really is. Because <laughs> this is not a weird thing. This is what happens in Portland, like, every Saturday on Sunday or whatever, when they have the... Um, the market, you know, that's that's Portland in a nutshell. It's gonna fall. It's gonna fall. <laughs> there it goes. So yeah, that's Portland. So I went to Portland, and at that time I didn't drink coffee because I found it like dark and bitter, and um, I only drank tea. And I went to a place that I thought was gonna have tea, and they were like, "Well, we don't have tea, but we have coffee." It's like, okay, I'm going to have coffee with milk. And I got this. And this is the best cup of coffee I ever had. It tastes of strawberries. And I was like, what is this? Is this how coffee is supposed to taste like? Like, what is this? Like, and everywhere I went to Portland, everywhere the coffee was amazing. It, it had just, like, mind blown. And the thing about coffee, as I learned, is, like, it, beans are very important. And um, there's this thing called third wave specialty coffee. And those are te te like usually hand-picked, usually single origin, usually lighter co light ro roasted, Jesus, light roasted coffees. And that produces really, really good coffee when you make it at home. Um, contrary to the popular belief in Lviv, Lviv sorry, coffee is not in mines. Like, <laughs> coffee comes from trees. <laughs> um, Although I had some coffee there uh, in the lobby, and that one I think came from a mine, because it <laughs> did not taste good. But <laughs> otherwise, this is where coffee comes from. And the thing with coffee, as you see, this is like a coffee branch, and this plant is really—I'm trying not to say a bad word—but you have really ripened fruit here and completely green fruit here. And what happens for all these like mass-produced coffees? Um, like the brands that you know, I don't know, Ely, Hausbrand, um, whatever. All of those brands are machine picked and then just very, very dark roasted, so you don't know the difference. Um, if you want really quality coffee, it has to be hand pick. Hand pick is expensive, obviously. Even though where coffee grows, the labor is cheap, it's still, you know, it's still expensive. Um, so first things first, it has to be hand picked. Then this is where coffee grows, Like right? There's only um, not big enough belt of where it grows, and most of the countries um, here and here are going through some sort of war. Uh, either it's like a civil war, or it's just like a uh, uh, territorial war. There's like none of these countries, only like Panama is really uh, good. All the other countries are very poor. So coffee is going to get more expensive once these countries get like normal again. Thing is, um, 
what you want coffee to be single origin. What that means is that it has to come, um, like the, the smaller the thing it comes from, the better. Like if it's from one country, great. If, if it's from one region, better. If it's from one farm, even better. Because um, that way you can have uh, even better tastes. And um, one problem that I have with hipsters, uh, in Kenya, which I love Kenyan coffee, um, they found it, it's more, um, it, it makes more sense for them, the farmers, to uh, plant avocados because hipsters now eat so much avocados. So they are throwing away coffee plants and I was like s seeding avocados. I really hate that. Like, ah, I want coffee, not avocado. Get your priorities straight, hipsters. Anyway, sorry, side note. Um, the thing with coffee is also uh, there's a lot of varieties and each variety produces a different kind of flavor. You might be familiar with wines. It's a very similar thing to wines. Like the wine depends, like the, the kind of a variety of grape plus the soil produces certain type of flavors. It's very similar with coffee. And the thing is, we don't know much about coffee because for wines, we've had like 500 years of how, uh, how they grow, what kind of uh, like soil they like with, with coffee. We're just like discovering for the past 20 years or so. You might be familiar with Arabica and Robusta. These are terms that are often used. And Arabica can mean anything on this side while well, Robusta usually means some shit there. Um, <laughs> if you can, try not to drink Robusta. Um, but that, let me just like quickly explain why, why this plants. Uh, so these are often find, uh, found in like this region. This is where Robusta really grows and Brazil. The, region is, uh, the reason is Robusta, as the name implies, is um, very robust. It, it doesn't care about climate as much, doesn't care about altitude. Because Arabica, now that's a pain in the ass. Like it, it only grows if the conditions are perfect. Like the altitude has to be perfect, the soil has to be perfect. There has to be sun, but not too much sun. There has to be shade, but not too much shade. It's, it's horrible. But if you have everything, if you get everything right, it tastes way, way better than Robusta. Anyway, moving on. This is coffee. This is how um, once you like have people pick it, and then you you do stuff with it. You can you can dry it like this. Uh, you can have it still um, uh, in in cherries, and then uh, depulp it. The thing is, there are a couple of different processes. I'm not going to go into it. Um, doesn't matter. But if if you see a label and it says natural, that's the best. It's probably going to be more expensive, but that's the best. And then you have, of course, roasting. Um, this is where you start, like green. Then you move forward, and then more and more roasted. This here, this is Ely, Hausbrand, and the known stuff. And this, I guess, is the good one. So like medium, light to medium. That's like personal preference. And if you want to do good coffee at home, this is what you need. So you need uh, a, a hipster uh, hipster kind of kettle. Doesn't matter, but you know, looks cool. You need a scale that does matter. It doesn't have to be this good. It can be any and like grinder that matters a lot. And then this thing called AeroPress. Um, the AeroPress is 30 euros, roughly. The grinder is going to be around 100 euros. And that is everything you need. That was my setup basically for three years. And I love the coffee it produced. But then, then I got crazy. Um, and yeah. No, so I'm an idiot. Do not do this. This is very expensive and you should not, you should never do this because it takes so much time. Like AeroPress, I was done in one minute. Just like grinds in, water in, push it out, coffee done. This, oh my God, it takes me like five minutes to make, make coffee. But it's good, but yeah, don't do this. Um, but the, I, I love it. I'm obsessed with coffee, so I invest a lot of money obviously in it. And um, I really enjoy all this preparation. I enjoy making coffee in the morning. I wake up with a smile on my face in the morning, like at 7 a.m., like the alarm's like, okay, I'm gonna make my coffee, and then I enjoy my coffee. Um, and you might be wondering, like, why would I have this at home? That's crazy, you're only at home in the morning and then you come at night. Well, I work remotely. Um, and this is what you, what you imagine when you hear someone works remotely, right? Well, the problem is, it's not like this. It's more like this. It's like, there's not enough space. You have this little tiny laptop, which keyboard sucks. 
so I have to use an old key old laptop just so you know keyboard works. You have like a lot of hipsters, everyone's loud, it's just everyone's talking. It's horrible. So, you know, remote, if you haven't read, it's a it's a book by D H H and uh, Jason. Um they believe and I agree that uh the best place to work is where you feel good. And um the the problem with work is that the work rarely happens at work because when you when you ask people like when you have a hobby project and you want to just work on something do you go to the office no you go somewhere where you can be just like alone and focused and work for three hours and in those three hours you get more done than like in most of the other days um, and the best thing about remote remote work sorry this is this is an exact chart. So this is a comparison of cost of living versus uh, average dev salary. It's an exact chart, but it, it's on a it's on a Bezos scale. So there are no numbers. Um, that's that's how it works. Uh, anyway, um, so in Slovenia, uh, average developer makes quite good money, and the uh, you know the cost of living is okay. In no why no come on, stupid. Okay, in Ukraine, it's cheaper to live, you get a bit less. In US, it's more expensive to live, you get more money. But when you work remotely, you can make a little less than US. So for them, you're very cheap. And you can be wherever you want other than US. And it's going to be more expensive than like here. But still, like you're going to have like that uh, difference, going to make it worth it. So that's why you should do remote. Another reason you should do remote is interruptions. Interruptions are the worst. How many times has a coworker come to you and said, "Hey, did you get my email?" That's like I will, I will reply to your email when I see your email. Just like leave me alone. I want to work. Because the problem is, when like when you're a developer, this is how it works, right? You look at some code that you probably wrote like two years ago, and you don't know what you were thinking. And you're like, okay, so if C is that, and I backtrack, and the current character is here, and then have hold this tree, and then he goes, hey, so I just sent you an email about that thing, and it's gone. And it's not, so it wasn't an interruption for like five seconds, it was an interruption, it like interrupted you for at least 15 minutes before you load the stack up and try to understand what is this code. And you know that when you get blame, it's always you, it's, it's always you. Um, another thing, uh, this is hell to me. I hate commuting. I hate spending time with so many people just like crowded somewhere. Um, it, you, you waste so much time because obviously there are so many people in the morning. Everyone's trying to get to the work. You're trying to get there. And you waste so much time every day in the morning and in the evening. And you can pretend to be productive, like being on a phone or whatever. But come on, you're not really. You're just checking Instagram or Twitter or whatever. It's not productive. So with remote, you don't have that. But Good thing about remote is you can pick how you want to work. So you can work in a, in a cubicle, you can rent like a small office, you can work in a co-working space if you like loud noises, or you can work at home like, like I do. Um, it doesn't matter. Good thing is you have the ability to choose. Because in most startups now, you go into this huge room where everyone works with each other, everyone constantly interrupts each other, no work gets done. It's just interruptions all day long. and then. You come in there two hours earlier just to get your work done, and then you stay two hours later just to get your work done. That's no way to live. I mean, come on. So with remote, you can choose your poison. Like maybe, maybe you don't want to work like me because that, like, it turns you into a hermit. You don't know how to talk to people anymore because you're just like all by yourself all day. That's not good. Or maybe you can go to a core. Maybe you can like you can go two days to co-working space and three days working at home. Whatever. The important thing is you get to decide how you like structure your work and this is this is me so if you're going to work from home first expense like buy an expensive chair buy a good chair i cannot say this like uh many times it's just like ergonomics really really matter so fuck laptop fuck everything else chair is the most important thing um i i like i'm 100% serious then, then you know, then you can invest in like in standing desk and or like air quality monitors and stuff like that to have good air. But like chair, that's the most important thing. The problem with working from home uh, is you know you don't move anymore. You're just at home and you sit all the time and you get fat. And I got I got fat. So 
I started running. Um, I was like, how hard can it be? I want to run a half marathon, right? Um, yeah, it was hard. So I started in, in June 2014. I was like, okay, um, in October, which is now, there's going to be in Ljubljana Marathon, which is on Sunday, which I'm competing in anyway. And um, it was like four months to get from n nothing to, you know, run. So this is me under, after like two kilometers. <laughs> This is, I can do this, like, what's 21, it's nothing. And uh, to me, I, like, t towards the end, I was destroyed. Like, I, 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 was, I was suffering so much the last three kilometers, I don't even remember doing. And after passing the finish line, I said, next year I'm gonna go for the full one, because I'm an idiot. So next year, again, I'm super happy, like, I was excited at the first 2K, but then, <laughs> you know, at 30K, not so more. At 35, I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, what's wrong with me? Why do I do this? And if you look at other people, like, we're all like, fuck my life. <laughs> it's just, it's horrible. So, of course, uh, that, was, that was done, right? Well, no, of course, I went to Berlin, because everyone, every marathon has to go, every marathon has to go to Berlin. So that's me at 5K, and I'm excited. That's me at the end. It's like, oh my God, make it end. But at least I got a beer. It was alcohol fry, as you can see. So uh, anyway, so yeah, I run a lot. Um, this is uh, like past 300. So every it's rolling 365 days of running. And right now, I'm at around 2,600 kilometers per year that I do. So you know why? Um, why do I do this? First reason, um, like I said, it's uh, losing some weight and, and being in shape and being sort of healthy. Being, so it allows me to eat junk food and still be like normal sized. Um, and the other thing is that it was sort of, I discovered by accident, but it's now, I think, primary motivation that I keep on running. It clears my head. I, I am uh, able to forget about work. I'm able to unplug. I'm able to... Um, think about other things. Uh, usually, I listen to podcasts or audiobooks, and that put me like in a, puts me in a completely different state of mind, and that helps me um, just um, you know cope with work because all we do is stressful, right? So you need something. You need either you go like to spar and box and whatever, or you go for a run or something. Um, so now you're like, yeah, I want to do this. Um, now the tips. I would give is like find a coach or a club. For some reason, if you start any sport, you always go to a coach. You always go to like, oh, I want to, I want to train. Just tell me what to do. But for running, we're like, I can do this. You know, I have legs. Everyone knows how to run, right? No, like we don't know how to run. Technique really matters. Um, so yeah, find a find a coach, find a club, at least to tell you like the beginning. Um, to, to, to do the right thing. So, because otherwise you'll damage your knees, you'll damage your spine, you'll damage your hip. It's, it can be unhealthy, but with the right technique, in, it can be healthier. Um, Couch to 5K is a good thing. It's an app. Um, it basically it is what, it, what the name means. So, if you're sedentary all the time, you never ran, this is a way to go. So, it tells you, like, first, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna walk. And then we're gonna run for 10 minutes, and then next day we're gonna run for 20 minutes, and and so on and so on. Eventually you do 5k. And the most important thing is go slow, because like when you start, you just want to go. You want you see those Kenyan runners who go like two hours for a marathon. It's like fuck yeah, I can do this. No, just like go slow. If you think you're going slow, go slower. Like just really, really slow. Just have have your pace. Just you know, um, one good thing about having a club or running with someone else is that you have a conversational pace. So these are my coworkers in, in Barcelona that we've been to. And having a conversational pace uh, forces you to go slower because otherwise you can't speak. So if you go slow enough, then you can speak. And yeah, um, I, I just want to go on a quick tangent. Oh, come on, what's up with this? It's just, uh. anyway, these are my coworkers in Barcelona. If you work remotely, uh, with any sort of company, have team retreats. Because um, being in Slack all day, chatting all day long, it's really easy to misunderstand other people. But when you get to know each other, then you know internal jokes develop. It, you know what kind of person someone is, and you can then you know, have some sort of 
um, uh, yeah, internal jokes that you have with each other. And it really helps. And you should do them like semi-regularly, at least like half a year or something like that. Because it really bonds the team together and you work better together. Because um, one of the downsides of working remotely is you don't really know your coworkers. Because you only know them at when work happens. You don't know them before work. You, there's no water cooler. There's no... Um, you know, pauses for smoking or stuff like that. You just know them when they work. And this helps a lot. Um, yeah, you get to know them on a personal level. Another thing, Slack. That's, don't, I mean, this is horrible. Because what Slack did now is like, you can bother anyone at any moment. This is like interruption factory. You see that green dot and like, oh, he's there. Bam, you start talking. That's horrible. You do that, you interrupt them, just, ugh. So on Slack, Rule number one, um, go out of as many channels as possible. Be in as little channels as possible. And in those that you are, mute them if you can. Because it's just like you're wasting time. You're just checking there. Oh, is something happening? Something happening? It's it's horrible. Allow, if you're a team lead, allow your members to focus. Tell them it's fine to be offline. It's fine to turn do not disturb mode on. Just um, be productive. Be uh, like... If, if you're a team lead, tell them it's fine, just disconnect, it's good. Just because work is more important than interruptions. And eventual response is better than immediate response. And another thing that I have a problem with are meetings. You know? Me, that's like interruption 101. Uh, there are always too many people, there's always too little agenda. And everyone wants to talk about their kids or their dogs or their weekend or whatever else. And they're just, you know, you have 10 people here. The meeting is for one hour because your Outlook allows like 30 minutes or one hour. It's like, oh, it's not going to be done in 30. Let's check the schedule for one hour. And then you have like preparation. And then after the meeting, and that's like, that wasn't one hour. There was like 15 hours because there were like 10 people, 10 hours plus preparations, 15 hours. That means, you know, money out the window. I love meetings. No, I really hate them. And the other thing with meetings is, you often go into this calendar Tetris. You see when someone is available, it's like, oh, there's a spot there, I can book it there. And then what that person do at the end of the day is like one meeting, next meeting, next meeting, next meeting. It's horrible. Try to do as little meetings as possible. And if you like any of what I was saying, again, I'm going to recommend, obviously I'm a fanboy. Um, this just came out like I think two weeks ago, something like that. It's a great book uh, by DHH, again, Jason. Um, it's it's very much about this. It's very much about how meetings are horrible, how interruptions are horrible, um, how Slack is horrible, stuff like that. I really, really recommend it. And now it's a technical conference, right? We have to have some technical stuff, um, obviously. Uh, <laughs> what's 30 minutes in? I mean, I'm doing well. Um, if you, uh, everyone, I, hopefully, who doesn't use Git? Awesome. Okay, I was scared there for a second. Cool. Um, so if you don't know, there is a thing called Hub. If you use GitHub, Hub, you just do this. In install Hub and use it. Because what Hub enables you to do, we don't use GitHub anymore, but what Hub enables you to do is you can browse stuff, you can check the CI status of your branch just like from your, from your command line, you can open a compare page, you can create a PR, you can fork from where you are, it, you can open... Um, uh, yeah, you can release, you can, so sync, that, the, the, the bottom one, that's awesome. If you have, if you're working on some um, like open source stuff and uh, they move their upstream forward, it's always like, oh, you have to now fetch upstream and then rebase origin master and then put everything up together just so I have their changes and my changes. Just sync does that. It's, it's amazing. If you use GitHub, I cannot recommend this enough. Just, just do it. Don't even think about it. Uh, Git checkout. Uh, I see many people not know this, but if you're, let's say you're on master and you want to uh, create a new branch and move to it. Most people do this in two steps. Like first they create the branch and then they check out the branch. If you do checkout minus B, it does that for you. So it creates a branch and switches to it. Um, minus, uh, it goes to the previous one. So we were on master, we created Pivorak, and we said git checkout minus, we go back on master. If you do git checkout minus, we go back on Pivorak. It's like awesome. If you don't know it, it's, it's awesome. 
Um, get diff. Like often you stage some stuff and then you do get diff and you don't see the diff. But there's a minus minus cached, which shows you the, the staged things as well. I did not know this until recently. Very useful. Um, if you have Rails, there's often stuff that you want to have just for you. You want to have your custom initializer where you maybe set up pry as your default thing, or maybe you have like, I don't know, just some hacks or some monkey patches or some shit that you want to do just for yourself. You don't want to push it upstream, right? It's just for your machine. And um, Git enables you to have exclude. And what exclude does, it's, it's like in, in the dot git slash info slash exclude, you can write in there and have and add this, for example, config initializes customer B, and it's not gonna it's it's gonna pretend that file does not exist. So it's like git ignore, but it's local to your computer. No one knows you have this in there. So that's awesome. If so, if it's stuff when you don't want to push it upstream, you don't want to put in git ignore because that's like your own custom stuff. Do this. Um, git rebase minus minus interactive or minus i. It's like that's the best thing since Git was invented. Um, if you if you rebase, if you move stuff, and you have a lot of commits, and you know, then some specs don't work or whatever, and you can just do git rebase minus i master, and then you can add like to the to the specs that you fixed. You put an f, and what f does is like fix up, and it's like squash. What squash? It uses commit melt into previous, but this one will discard the message. So what will happen? You will end up with one commit, and this one add nice feature, that will be the only commit left, but we'll, it will include this commit. It's, it's amazing. And you can reward, so you made a mistake in your commit, you can reward stuff, um, you, can, you can execute commands if you want. It's, it's amazing. Now, another thing you might not know, that we as humanity, we have invented Time Machine. And I'm, I'm not speaking about this, which is still good, but no, I'm speaking about Reflock. Like, that is just magic. No matter what you do, no matter how, like, how fuck up your, your rebase, whatever you do with Reflock, you can always go back. Like what Reflock does, if maybe you don't know it, is um, it keeps everything that you did in its history. So even if you, had, uh, if you did a rebase and only like, later you realize that you, based, you, you maybe did some squashes on the merge commit or some shit that you shouldn't do, with rebase, you can just go back in time, go back to before you did that, and then go forward. So if, if there's just one thing you take away from this talk, it's like, that's, that's the number one thing. Like, that's amazing. Another amazing thing is Git bisect. Um, it's very simple, especially if you have specs, which, of course, your Rails developers, you all have great coverage, right? Um, you start bisect. Um, so Let's say we have a failing fixture, but we don't know failing failing spec, but we don't know when it started. So we just mark a commit good, and we mark another one bad, and we give him a command to run, and it will tell us, oh, this is the commit. Like, it's just it's incredible. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, use use that stuff. Now back to not technical stuff. Um, I used to be an event photographer. Now I only take photos of puppies because um, you know they're cuter. Um, and uh, I will tell you one weird trick that photographers don't want you to know. Uh, not really, but it's very simple. If you have an iPhone, but even if you have any other phone, there's probably this setting. It allows you to enable grid in, in iPhones, like settings, camera, grid. And what this does, it it shows you like this rule of thirds. Um, it's the simplest rule of photography. It's very, very simple, and it will make your photos 200% times percent better, whatever, it's just much better. Um, and the, all you need to know about rule of thirds, when you have that thing in, in your phone, is like, don't put anything important in the middle. Like, it can be anywhere around, preferably on the crosses, like that's, that's the most ideal, but don't put anything in the center. Now, here's what I mean by that. It's a nice picture, right? But like it's in the center. Now, if we move it out a bit and remove the frame, it's much nicer. So before, F, well, no, no, before, after, yeah. So this is before, this is after. Much nicer. We just moved it, and like whenever, whenever you're taking 
you 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 tend to put stuff in the center because you're like oh my like the center is there it focuses there by default so you put people there like don't do this also same don't shoot the sky like we have half of image which is useless if you just put it down a bit now much nicer pic picture there's no sky there's like everything is in proportion it's still a gopro photo so everyone's like oh but like you know um this like one weird trick like just enable thirds try not to put anything in the center that's if you look at my photos on instagram that's like 90 90 percent why they look good the other 10 percent is a beautiful oh, no, come on it's I'm just, I'm not going to use this anymore. It's, uh, it's abusing reflections. Um, so you see a puddle and you can, you can use it to showcase the uh, like nice mountains that you had. Or you can completely abuse it by just turning it around. And it's such a simple thing, but it makes a really cool photo. And, you know, never be afraid to make mistakes. That's like not, not just in photography, but like the only way you can learn is is by making mistakes. Mm. Um, okay, five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I have the. I. I <laughs> that's good because now, now I only have the the deep stuff. Uh, <laughs> no, so I'm gonna get serious in five minutes. Okay, um, uh, we're gonna skip the questions. Ten minutes. Um, now I I want to talk about stoicism. Stoicism is something that I found by accident, and it's a 2,300-year-old thing, and I'm mad that no one told me about this before. It's a, it's a philosophy, it's really old, and I'll just briefly tell you what it's about. Um, but first, I have to address this. So worldwide, antidepressants are on the rise, and it's crazy. Also the same, I didn't want to put it on the slides, but the same with suicide rates. This is the most unhappy we've been in history of the world which is weird because we've never had so much money there's like never has there been so little people in poverty like this is the green is the people who are not in the poverty and you know this is just like what 200 years it's amazing it's amazing and it makes no sense like everyone now has like enough to survive we all have internet in our pockets. We have these smart devices that are like beyond our comprehensions what they can do. Like this, this thing is now faster than my, lap, well, my, my laptop, obviously, but now even faster than my computer at home, desk computer. It's, it's insane. And we have everything. We have good nutrition. We have quality water. Um, AI is getting insanely good, yet we're killing ourselves like crazy and we're taking happy pills just to survive the day. It's, it's horrible. And I think the reason is we, we think this is how it goes. So you do great work, you get successful, and you think you're going to be happy. And it doesn't happen that way. Because the problem is something that smart people call hedonic adaptation trap, whatever. Uh, it can be also hedonistic treadmill. There's like many, many uh, expressions for this. But basically what it means is like you're unhappy, you want something. You get it, and then you adapt to it and then you're unhappy again. So for example, like I want a car, I get a car, and then I'm like, this car sucks, I want a better car. I get that car, I see my neighbor, he has Ferrari, he's like, fuck, I want a Ferrari. And then I buy a Ferrari, it's like, you know, have a shit ton of money, I'm like super happy, I have Ferrari, I'm so happy. After a month, I'm like, uh, okay, fine. And my neighbor, he gets like, I don't know, a Lamborghini, right? It's like, ah, oh, it, looks, it looks better, ah, uh, fuck, you know? And that's, that's even, even like on smaller scale, like you want, I don't know, um, you, you want a race. You get that race, you're very happy for two months. After two months, like you adapt to it. This is my salary now and you're unhappy again. You want a bigger race. And that's, that's sad. And this is how human mind works because we always want something more. We always want the next thing. And this is how it should work. Like you're happy. And when you're happy, you do great work, and that leads to success. Now, easier said than done, right? I mean, just, okay, now everyone is happy. No, it doesn't work like that. But the philosophy of Stoicism, it has three main points. Um, first thing is, you see things for what they really are. So if someone spills, like we're going to have an uh, after party, after I stop talking, maybe, and, and someone pours beer on you, and you can be like, oh, fuck, you destroyed my shirt. Like, oh, come on. But 
you can also like take it another way. It's like it's just a shirt. You know, I can easily go buy another shirt. It's like, yeah, maybe it looks like I, I'm wet and shit, but every one I'm gonna approach is gonna be what happened there. And you have a story to tell, and you can look at it from that perspective, and then, you know, you're just not gonna be mad about it. It's like, yeah, it's happened, you know, now I have a story. And every time you're gonna go, you're saying, look, you know, you know what happened to me? Someone spilled me with beer, and then I was like, the whole night was amazing. And the other thing is, be a good person. Like, be that guy. You know, he's, he's in peace, but he's helping his friend. And, you know, like, when, when, when that guy is going to need help, of course he's going to help him, because he was a good friend. Be a good friend. Like, just, it doesn't matter. You don't have to, like, <laughs> stand in a puddle of piss. You can also do something nicer. Like, whenever you have a choice, be the nice person if you can be. Like, that's, that's uh, most, well, one of the three rules that are very important. But you know, just when you have a choice, be the nice person, because you know how good it feels when someone is nice to you. That's all that matters. And the third thing is, there are things that matter, and then there are things that you can control. Like, that's basically the number one rule of stoicism. Um, you can only control what you think about things. You cannot control the weather. You cannot control, like, um, what people think of you. You cannot control what's popular on, on Hacker News right now. So don't worry about that stuff. Don't worry which JavaScript framework is popular this week. Like, it doesn't fucking matter. Just do things that you can control, do things that you like, this is what you should focus on. Like, that's, that's really, really important. And because we are spending so much time worrying about things that don't matter. For example, I'm going to run a marathon on Sunday, and it's going to rain. It's going to be heavy rain, it's going to be really cold, and it's going to be strong winds. And I, now I could quit, and I was like, fuck this shit. But, you know, I can't control the weather. It's just going to be an amazing story I'm going to tell. Like, I'm going to freeze to death, probably. But, you know, it's, it's going to be fun. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, I should focus on being the best I can. And there are two essential tasks. Be a good person and pursue occupation you love. Obviously, we have the privilege to be developers, which is like, we like this job and it's well paid. Not everyone has this privilege, but just pursue it. Be better at it. Like every day, try to be better. And if you like this, I can recommend this. It's a, it's a book uh, called A Guide to the Good Life. Um, it's a um, sort of intro to stoicism. It's divided in three uh, sort of uh, parts. First part is on the history, like the best 2,000 years, and then it's like the practices, how you should do stuff, and then how it applies to modern world. So it's a, it's a relatively new book. I think it's like uh, five years old or something. It's really good. Another thing, write a journal. Uh, I only recently got into this practice, but I can tell you firsthand it has amazing, uh, it made amazing, it made a huge difference. And the thing is, in the morning I write uh, things I'm, help, I'm thankful for and things I'm looking forward uh, in the day. At the evening, I write down uh, three amazing things that happened. It takes like three minutes in the morning, three minutes in the evening, but it makes a ton of difference. Um, this is called five-minute journal. You don't have to use that. You can use whatever you want because we only have a limited amount of time, right? Spend it on things that matter. Don't spend it fighting with some internet trolls about why like, this network is better than that network, why, I don't know, Cryptocurrency is gonna kill everything. Like, it just like spend it on things that matter. Um, or, yeah, that's just what I wanna what I wanna say. And thank you. Thank you. Really, do you have questions? No. Okay. There's one. There's two. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, he's a speaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Closer. Um, hello. Hi. So What's your name again? My name. I'm Aaron. Okay. Um, nice to meet you. I I was wondering. Um, I've been doing remote work for quite a while now, and it there's a lot more negative sides that I see than ones that you you brought up. Do you have other? Yeah, I was trying to sell it. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so the the one that I sort of alluded to uh, that I really uh, try to combat against is the cabin hut fever. So just being all alone by myself uh, too many times. And the thing is, once you get used to how nice it is when you're alone, 
it generally don't go out and then it's just like it, it's, a, it's a vicious circle. It goes worse and worse, which is why I started the meetup to, you know, uh, be with, with friends. Uh, but I don't know, what are the things that you experience? What the bad ones? Uh, <laughs> try, trying to, uh, what, like, splitting my, my life, like actually working like an eight hour day that's consistent and not splitting my day up between like learning about stuff and then actually getting work done. Whereas if I was in an office, I would like, would you really, I think so. I really think so. When I've been in offices, I've been more like that, but well, it's like, it's hard for me to bill for things that I would be instantly being billed for in an office. Well, yeah. Well, one thing that at least helped my friends who had were in similar situation is they rented offices together. So they're working for different companies, but they're working together in a small office with four people. So that maybe helps, but I don't know. Thank you. You're welcome. There was a uh, that guy. Yeah. What, what, the the last. Shirt. The last. The last. The question is actually the same. Maybe you can share some tips when you uh, find some problems because you work remotely. For example, you're doing demo and internet is gone or. Uh, different uh, things, uh, how you can, uh, like, and life hacks, how you can resolve it? Um, those are things I can't control. Um, I can go back <laughs> to the slide. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, um, in all seriousness, if internet fails, like, there's nothing you can do. Like, it failed. And, and people understand. That's, that's another, another thing. Like, if you don't abuse your privilege, people will understand um, that... Uh, you know, something happened. If you if you're gonna say like every every other week, oh my internet is down, my internet is down, there are people like going, ah, is it really like you you you're hiding something? But you know, if if it happens a couple of times, people understand. Uh, thanks for conversation and presentation and for this mention of stoicism. And my last question is, what is f your favorite sort of the coffee? Oh, <laughs> that's a hard one. Um, uh, one thing I didn't want to go into uh, with coffee is that um, unlike wine, you can, wine you can archive. And if you really like particular wine of particular year, you can put it in your cellar and you can drink it to the rest of your life. With coffee, like, it becomes stale. So it's only good when it's good. So I had amazing coffees from everywhere. I've had amazing coffees from Ethiopia, from even Myanmar, from countries you wouldn't expect. And I've had terrible coffees from Ethiopia and other places. So it's really hard to answer. I just encourage you to try as many different ones as you can. Thank you so much.